Hello, 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 hello. My goodness. Well, well, well. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. <laughs> All right, here I am, the king of the trailers. So? Mr. DeVito? Mr. DeVito over here? <laughs> Where? On your oh, right. Over there. On your right, right here. Over there, yes. Hi. Hi! <laughs> Do you ever plan to play a good guy role? No. <laughs> Okay, next question. Right over here. <laughs> well, you know how it is. You, uh, you, try to, uh, you, know, you try to pick the good projects. And it um, seems like the good projects, that I, the ones I like, I'm always a rat. So, I don't know. Maybe someday, you know, I'll play the, uh, you know, priest. Mr. DeVito. Priest gone wrong. <laughs> In a convent. <laughs> Well, I went to Catholic school, you know, they used to say, you know, it was a joke. I don't know if you ever heard it. You know, it was like, uh, um, it was the thing I was thinking, uh, I was thinking about Sister Teresa last night, all night long, and they said, it's a good thing you can do that, but just don't get in the habit. That was it. <laughs> so what? Yeah. I was wondering if you could uh, tell us the best joke you've heard in a long time. The best joke I, I don't know, oh, gee, oof. Oh, um, come on, you got to have a good a one. A joke? Yeah. Uh, well, my favorite joke is about the, the guy who goes in the psychiatrist's office, and he says, Doc, all night long, I'm dreaming about wigwams and teepees. And the doctor says, well, I know your problem. You're too tense. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Bad? Not good? I got a real dirty joke. You want to hear it? No, no, no. I can't do that one. Okay. No, I, I really don't. You know, I can't do that. I, I feel very uncomfortable standing up in front of a bunch of people <laughs> telling jokes. <laughs> I swear to God. Anyway, go ahead. Next question. Really serious. What? Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, was it your idea to cast Anne Ramsey in the show? Did you find her, or how did the decision come about? Yeah. <laughs> it's my idea. Well, actually, you know, we were, we were preparing the movie, and, and you know how it is. You... Uh, you know, you're searching, you're hunting, you got a good, the script was coming along, and uh, I had Billy, and, uh, you know, I'm going to be Owen, and everything's going on, but if you don't have a mama, you really don't have a movie, so I was looking everywhere, I went to New York, and uh, Chicago, and I, I, I was desperate, I was at the end of my rope, I was up to the point where people were, you know, offering up their mothers, they were going, you should meet her, she's no good, you, you know, you'll hate, you know, my aunt, you, my aunt will just puke on you, you know, and all this stuff. <laughs> And, um, you know, it was getting very frustrating until the, uh, the last minute. It was like maybe two weeks before we were going to begin rehearsal. And uh, I had worked with Ann Ramsey uh, many years ago in a movie called Going South. And she played a, a kind of a jolly townswoman, you know, in the little western town. Uh, Jack Nicholson directed the movie and was in it. And, and the casting director recommended her. She said, you should meet Ann Ramsey. I said, well, I know her, you know, and she's very, like, you know, it's... But I'll meet her anyway. It was a woman walked in the office and just put me in a headlock. You know, it was one of those things. She came in. She got the part. She was terrific. Um, and uh, she, she had had a little history. Uh, she changed physically a great deal from the time I knew her. She had this uh, incredible bout with cancer. I mean, this is like a – this story is like, uh, you know, she, she had um, surgery and it had it removed and she beat it. Right, like so. A year before she came into my office, she was like on her deathbed. We sort thought it was over, right? And she went through this whole thing, and she lost, you know, some muscle. Uh, she couldn't use her left arm, and, and so she walked in. I said, "My God, this woman came in. What a character! She she did such great homework, you know. <laughs> I mean, she really came in like, oh, Danny, I haven't seen you in a long time." I say, God, Ann, you know, we, we could, you can let, the, let it down now. We could talk like, you know, <laughs> no, I can't. <laughs> and, um, oh, you know, man. turned out, uh, you know, well, you see her in the movie. She's terrific, yeah. Thanks. So, but it was my idea, yeah. Next question. Over here, over here. Yo. <laughs> Yo. So I got here and here. Is that it? Yeah. 
Hey, I can figure it out. <laughs> it gets complicated. Oh, yeah, yeah. It, you, you've, I've taught writing courses off and on for about I'm, 10 years at You college. probably say that again? I've taught writing courses. Right. So I was really impressed by the way you guys, you and Billy Crystal, and again, caught the nuances, weirdnesses, subtleties, the whole trip. Right. How did you um, uh, engineer that? I mean, did you take courses? Did you sit in courses? Did you have uh, people who have uh, professional uh, involvements, or is this just on the, on the instinct, on yeah, the radar? Well, well, in terms of the, the, the writing aspect, what happened, the way, the way I came about uh, with this script was uh, that Stu Silver, who's the writer of the script, wrote a, a comedy that the premise was what it, what it is in the film. These two guys, and we used the Hitchcock thing and all that. But it was very broad. It was like, um, it was uh, very, very un... Like, like just broad, you know, like people mm -hmm. falling off of ski slopes and right. trying to kill mom in a scuba suit and, you know, and, you know putting yeah. her underwater. And so what I did basically was take all that away and try mm -hmm. to get down to the characters uh, pretty much. Right. And, um, and it resulted in what we, what we made, throw mom from the train. In terms of, like, studying and things like that, I, I you know, I just have been, you know, I'm a, I'm a student Negligent. and I've been doing it for... 25 years. So you did a great job. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. What? Okay. Good. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Once again, on Throw Mama from the Train. What was uh, the obsession with cows? Cows. <laughs> well, I don't. You know, it was like what I was trying to do was find one thing. You know, Owen was to me like a, a, a man-child, you know, he was kind of like, you know, I remember when I was a kid, you know, you have these you have dinosaurs, you have this, you have that, that kind of thing, um, people save bugs, this, whatever. I figured that, that, that Owen, like, kind of, you know, liked cows, you know, he just, like, kind of liked them whenever he saw them, and, um, and uh, you know, and there, there, there are other things, like, um, you know, that he never left his mother and all stuff like that. No. Okay, so <laughs> anyway, you know, he's always there with the, you know, it was kind of like, you know, that kind of stuff. Cows. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. Thanks. Oh, you're welcome. Can you tell us something about the people who have played a formative part in the development of your career? <laughs> <laughs> well... Well, let's look. Okay, I'll take that. First of all, people that I like, you know, there's certain filmmakers that I like. There are a lot of there are a lot of actors that I I enjoy watching, you know. And over the years, what you do is like, you know, I mean, to name them, I mean, it just goes on. Like all, think of all the filmmakers you feel like are really like, like Scorsese and and uh, De Sica and and people like that, Fellini and Polanski and blah 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 blah, blah all the way down the line. So those people, like you know, you like look at. In terms of influence, actors, you know, I, I like to, you know, I look at uh, Olivier and uh, De Niro and, uh, uh, you know, people like, like uh, in, the, in those, you know, those kind of areas, you look at those people for influence. And in terms of like spirit, like um, the people who influenced my life, my friends, like Michael Douglas is in career wise, Michael Douglas, very important person in my in my life, uh, who uh, we always thought we'd do stuff together, and Nicholson was, uh, I met him during Cuckoo's Nest, and we stay in touch, and, uh, you know, they, they sort of like, uh, you know, the people you call and say, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just about, uh, you know, at the end of my rope, you know, in the early days, and just, those kind of things, if that's what you mean. Yeah. And also the Pope. I don't know. <laughs> oh, God. <clears throat> uh, and, uh, <laughs> To compliment you, Mr. DeVito, not only on the acting job in, uh, in Throw Mama, which was quite, I mean, just, just brilliant, Thanks. but on the directing also, and uh, particularly uh, in both aspects, the, the little train scene was, was very, very... The little train very, scene? The train scene. You mean the, the little trains on the porch? Yeah, uh, the, the, the toy trains. The yeah. toy trains, yeah. Yeah, that was just really neat. And uh, I'd like to know what... Uh, are some of the projects that you may uh, you may be doing in the future, acting, directing? Okay, well, in the future, well, the project that I'm working on right now, uh, we're going to start shooting April 18th, and um, it's it's called Twins, 
and stars me and Arnold Schwarzenegger. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we begin that in April. <laughs> serious. <I'm> serious. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and um, and then immediately after that, well, in the fall. I'm going to direct and star in a movie called uh, The War of the Roses. The movie that I'm doing with Arnold, uh, a man named Ivan Reitman is going to direct, uh, who did Ghostbusters, and it's going to be lots of fun. And The War of the Roses is a movie uh, that uh, um, I'm doing uh, uh, at Fox. Uh, Jim Brooks is going to produce it, and uh, I'm going to star in it, and it's about divorce. <laughs> <laughs> it's comedy. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Okay. Um, two quick questions. Were you, when did you really start going on calls and auditioning? And the second one, were you always going around improvising or just thinking up slime bag characters like you play all the time? Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, uh, well, first of all, I, I went to the American Academy of Dramatic Arts. I went in 1963 uh, or four around there. And, um, and immediately... Upon uh, my graduation, I uh, went to, I, I was in Manhattan, and I made the rounds, which was, to me, to, the rounds there were like, uh, you know, you get your pictures, and you lie in your resume, and you, uh, and you go to, you know, we went to agents. In Manhattan, it's different, because it's, like, not here. Like, I know here it's, like, you know, spread out, and there's a studio here, there's a studio there. It's an agent here, here, there. In New York, it's kind of concentrated on that little in the between 42nd uh, Street and uh, maybe 57th Street, around in there. So we'd make the rounds. I did all that and, you know, go on by backstage and show business with the two magazines or papers there. And, um, and I'd go, on anyth- go up for anything. Anything. I mean, anything that's said. It's male, I'd go up for it. <laughs> Didn't matter. It's... Blonde, dancer, tall, sings well, ba ba bum, I was there. <laughs> I, you know, you, at least you turn ahead, you know. They go, oh yeah, you in the right place? Yeah. I'm here. <laughs> Are you? Yeah. <laughs> so um, that was the first question. What was the second question? Were you, did you go oh, Always play improvise? slime bags. Right, oh, yeah. or were you improvising that, or were you just thinking Well, impro- you know, improvisation is a big part of it, you know, that you, in study, scene studies, and in ca- you know, class, you do, you, you, uh, you improvise, uh, that's, you work toward, that's one of the areas you work with. And uh, I, uh, you know, I, I didn't always, like, just pick the, uh, actually, it wasn't until uh, when I did Louie on uh, Taxi that, you know, started getting a lot of, uh, uh Bad press, you know, but uh, you know, but uh, uh, you know, I, I I improvised other other things too, other characters as well. <clears throat> yes, from *Romancing the Stone* to *Jewel of the Nile*, I'm curious. Do you and Michael Douglas have a third one in the mix? Or well, you know, it's it's very interesting because he we've been trying to do a third one, but um, it seems like either Kathleen is busy, or I'm busy, or Michael's busy, or it's like it's getting everybody, you know, in that groove. And also the studio is like, uh, you know, they're very reluctant to spend $100 million for the cast. <laughs> you know, so I don't know. Um, um, you have, uh, I have two separate questions for you. One is... Um, you and your wife both seem to play these rotten, miserable characters <laughs> all the time. Or, well, uh, do your kids have well, a hard time understanding this? Do you have a problem explaining this to? <laughs> that was one question. The other thing is, how did you go about choosing the uh, cameraman or camera style for Throw Mama? I think it's the same right. guy from the the Coen Brothers film. Yeah, Blood Simple and Raising Arizona. Well, first of all. Uh, my kids are the same as I am, so we all get along really well. <laughs> you know what I'm and um, uh, you know, Rhea, of course, plays the, the Carlon Cheers, and uh, and she is just she's a miserable person, and she always was. <laughs> and uh, and uh, Lucy and Gracie, my my oldest daughter is f- going to be five, 
And um, Gracie's three. I have a boy, Jacob, who's just born. He's four months old, and he's worse than all of us. He's just, <laughs> and um, it's a lot of fun around the house. We, we just, you know, we have a good time. And in terms of Barry Sonnenfeld, I, I saw Blood Simple was the first time I was exposed to Barry's work. I thought it was great. I just thought he was right for our movie stylistically. And, uh, and then um, and I had good fortune. He was scheduled to do another movie uh, called Big, right, which is coming out. It's uh, Tom Hanks' movie. And, and um, actually at the time, they, they were going to hire Bob, Robert De Niro to play the part. And they were going through some kind of like, you know, those things they go through where the studio doesn't want to pay the price and he wants this and they want this and he wants this. And they were fighting over this. And, they, and Barry was already uh, c contracted to do that film. And I was looking around for other DPs, you know. And uh, then at the last moment, I was in New York. I was doing publicity for Tin Men. And um, I found out the film dropped out. He, he lived about... I don't know, eight blocks from where I was doing this press junket, right? So I got a script, and I ran it up to his house. I put it, you know, and I, I banged on the door. I'd never met the man before, and I got him the script. That night, we got drunk on sake, <laughs> and we, uh, you know, and the rest is history. <laughs> so. Thank you. Um, I hear over and over again that it's harder to direct good comedy than it is to direct good drama. And um, you seem to have done okay in the comedy mode. So I was wondering, do you ha have you found anything to be the kind of the key to directing good comedy? Well, first of all, I don't know if it's harder to direct good comedy than it is to direct good whatever that was you said. Was it drama? Dramatic. Dramatic, tragedy, uh, opera. Uh, I, I, I really don't know. Um, I know that uh, what I like to do is I like to stay true to the characters once you beat in on who they are and, uh, and as, as much as possible have whatever funny stuff is happening come out of the reality of the characters. Um, although it's not bad to like uh, do something that's over the top you know, because there's a lot of room for that in uh, you know, farce and and, uh, you know, out there, people enjoy that, too. You don't want to just do one kind of comedy. But uh, for me, I think that the key for me is to, like, stay true to the, work, to the, com to the characters and the script, the story. You sh sh shouldn't stay true to the script if it's a piece of shit. You should stay true to the script if it's, you know, it's real and, and honest. <coughs> How did you and Rhea Perlman meet? What's her name? No, no. I was in a play called uh, 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 The Shrinking Bride, where I played this demented stable boy. And in the first scene, in the first scene of the play, I was at the apron of the stage, right? And she's the daughter of the landowner, right? And I play the stable boy, and we're in the garage. You know, we're having a good time. See, this is like my, I'm a paramour, in other words. And I'm spitting, and she says, what are, you, what are you doing, Richie? And I say, I'm spitting on the swans. <laughs> now, you know, so somewhere in the middle of the maybe third, fourth row, like, it, got, it always got to laugh, you know? And uh, uh, this one woman went absolutely out. She was wild. She was going crazy. And all through the play, she was going nuts, you know, whenever I was on stage. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I just had to meet her. You know? So anyway, afterwards, it turned out she was uh, Rhea, was Rhea, and she was friends with the woman who was playing the uh, part opposite me in the play. So we all went to the cookery which was a place on 8th Street where Alberta Hunter, I don't know if you know, she just died not long ago. She's a great jazz singer. She used to play every night. She played with a little jazz combo. So we went there and we had a cup of coffee and uh, that's how we met. And that was like 1970. First, sir, I want to congratulate you also on your excellent acting. Um, 
You're like a doctor. You keep me continually in stitches, and I really mean it. Uh, I'm very impressed. <laughs> um, <laughs> there's one question I've been dying to ask, and please don't think I'm being facetious or anything, yeah. but I'm full of curiosity. Perhaps some people here also have some interest in the question. Um, sir, what is your real mother like? My mom? Yeah. Oh, well, first of all, her name is Julia. She was born in Asbury Park, New Jersey, where I was born. Thank you, thank you. She's uh, 83 years old. She's very, very sweet. She's an Italian woman who spent a lot of time uh, looking over her shoulder from the stove going, eat it all, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> and um, she's, <laughs> uh, she's a very, very sweet woman. Um, and uh, she was ab actually... You've, I don't know if you saw, she was in two taxi episodes. My, my real mother was in two taxi episodes. One, one episode where Louis, we were looking for somebody to play the part. We could, it was very difficult to find somebody to play the part. Uh, one, one episode was um, where I put her in a home, and uh, Louis gets rid of her. And he's going to have like parties every night now, and, and he can't keep her there. And he goes, and we have a scene through a, a door where she won't open the door, and then... Then we co she comes out and she hands me her suitcase or something like, or doesn't. And, and then in another episode, she marries a Japanese gentleman. Do you remember that? And, she, and it was great because we got my mom, she's like but this high, and she was like in the late 70s at the time. She'd never acted before, you know, we just, I made her do it. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, actually, we were looking for somebody for a really long while to, it was the same kind of thing, you know. It's like when I was looking for throw, the mother and throw mama. I mean, it's, it's very, there are certain age ranges. It was very difficult to find uh, the actors uh, to play the parts. And, and we were looking for somebody, and Ed Weinberger, who was one of the creators of the show, said, you know, he had met her, and he said, why don't, you, uh, why don't we call your mother? And I said, no way, I'm not going to. That's all I need, you know, i got to have my mother. And, and she says, no, look, well, you know, maybe, I said, I don't know, will you ask her? I said, so we're in his his office and uh, and he calls her up and he puts her on the speaker phone thing the speaker box and she goes hello <laughs> so, so Mr. DeVito said Weinberger oh hi Ed how are you I said okay uh, listen uh, Danny's here where oh, he's right here hi Ma how you doing hi Danny how are you right here, so, so look we gotta ask you a question we're doing a show blah 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 mother blah 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 we wanna know if you know, it's not a lot of, you don't have to learn a lot of lines. You know, uh, you just come on, you, you just, it's not going to be a lot of work. In the middle of it, she says, hey, I could do dialogue. <laughs> so, so, I, so we, we talked to her, so what does she, what does she want, right? She's going to get the top of the show, whichever, whatever that is. You know, they, they have a certain pay rate for the guest stars of the show. And... And what, and what else? So they picked her up at the airport in a limousine, right? They had an escort. They got, they got a woman to be with her, like, to take care of her. She had, at the time, she smoked. Like, she's in her late 70s, right? She's since quit. She had, she, yeah, she, uh, she, had, um, she had to have a TV in her dressing room because she didn't want to miss her stories. You know, she sits and watches soap operas all day long. That's it. Right? So she had the TV in the dressing room. She had the limousine drop her off at work every day. Right? She had like the carton of cigarettes, little brandy, whatever she wanted, a coffee machine. Right? Now you got Tony Danza and Judd and Mary Lou and everybody's walking around going, hey, what is this? My dressing room's like a hole in the wall. Your mother's got the... Uh... Anyway, she's a very sweet woman. Thank you, sir. You really made my day. Oh, thank you. Thank you. But anyway, she did quit smoking. This is interesting. I was doing Ruthless People, and she calls me up. She's like now, uh, I don't know when we did that. She's like in her she, 80. She says she's 79, 80. 80 years old. She goes, she calls, she usually, when she calls you, she's like, oh, how you doing? What's going on? How's this? How's Bria? How's it going? She goes, hello. I said, who's this? It's Mama. So, oh, Mom, what's, what's going on? I got a pain in my stomach. 
I went to the doctors. I'm going to have tests. I said, oh, oh, yeah, yeah. She said, but I'll tell you, I quit smoking this morning. She's only been smoking 60 years now. <laughs> I said, good, that's good, Ma. You know, I'm, I'm being up and I'm worried about it and everything, right? And I said, okay, so she goes and has the tests, right? Next day she calls me. I had the tests. I said, okay, huh? well, okay, well, tomorrow we get the results. <laughs> so, all right, all right, Ma. All right, well, don't worry about it, you know, and everything. So the next day, she calls me up. I'm, I'm like in my trailer at the Santa Monica on the pier with, with Bette Midler. I'm, she's going to throw me off any minute, right? I get the phone. I say, hello? She said, hey, I got an ulcer. <laughs> so, but <laughs> she quit smoking that day anyway, so she's been off the... The, the weed for like now, uh, I mean the, <laughs> she's been off, she's been off of uh, tobacco for uh, like about three, four years now. She looks like a million bucks, I mean really, uh, it, it's a terrible habit, disgusting. Nobody out here smokes, right? A lot of people smoke, huh? You smoke? No, it's sh shitty, go ahead, Who, who's next? <laughs> Plus, you got to dry clean your clothes after and everything. So, What? Over there. Over there. I was just curious. You did so well with Taxi. Would you consider doing another television series? No. Okay. <laughs> no, no. I, I, I enjoyed it very much. It was a great five years, and I loved all the people that we worked with. You know, like, but you, it's, a, it's a thing to try to recapture that. It's, like, very, very difficult. You know, there was a great spirit there. You know, uh, not only great scripts and... and uh, uh, you know, great the great writers and all that stuff, Jim Brooks and Weinberger and all those great talents, and the and the cast was like a family, and you know, you, and then you try to go grab it again, and that's no, you know what I'm saying? I have my taxi watch on, as a matter of fact. I love the show. I I really I really enjoy doing it. Hi, Andy. Andy's died, dead. But he's flying around the building. <laughs> Speaking of taxi, what were uh, Christopher Lloyd and Andy Kaufman really like? Well, it's funny you should ask. <laughs> well, Christopher Lloyd is a very, very talented actor. Uh, and, uh, you know, I mean, he's, a, he's an actor, a uh, character actor. He's nothing like the character that you saw of Iggy, you know. <laughs> Bean brain. <laughs> you know, he, he played the moron very well. Uh, you know, he, he's, uh, he's just a very good actor. He's doing a lot of work. He's going to do, he's going to be in a movie. Called, well, he was in Back to the Future, which we played a wild man. That, uh, that was very good. He's doing a movie called uh, Roger Rabbit now. That's uh, going to be out next year. It's this big Spielberg uh, movie where they have animation and live characters on the screen together that Robert Zemeckis is directing. And uh, he's right now doing a John Sayles movie. He's like my, or, Andy, on the other hand, hi, Andy, is, was like, he, he, as far as I'm concerned, he was like a conceptual artist. The man was like, he could get you to believe anything, you know? And he was very strange, Andy. No, really, seriously, I mean, like, you know, he did that character of Latka, um, you know, and he was very, you know how he was on the well, off stage in the dressing room, he was similar. He was he was similar to that. You know, he's very quiet. He's very uh, you know he's into like he ate lots of he ate health food. He was exercised. He didn't smoke. He didn't drink. Uh, he was very very pure kind of guy and very um, he's very quiet and but but always thinking about his next scam. He was always putting you on. I mean you know the thing about he used to do he did Tony Clifton. You know that character that he did where he'd, he would swear that it wasn't him. Yeah. You know, he, he did this lounge lizard. He'd come out with the, he'd do five hours of makeup, put jowls on, different color hair. he put on um, a cologne that would like knock you out of the room, you know, and, and he had a jacket on and he'd come out and he'd do this and he'd insult people. Hey! You know, and he'd, he'd do his act. And people hated him, they'd boo him and they'd, you know, and he was the opening act for Andy a lot. And Andy claimed that what he was doing was just giving his friend a break. 
But he never admitted to the fact that he was Tony Clifton. <laughs> no, it's true. We did a show. We tried to do a show once called Brother Rat. It was the first year. And they came up to me and they said, we're going to have, you're going to play, your brother comes to town and he's nasty to your mother and he doesn't, you know, he's like a gambler. And I said, who's going to play the part? He said, and Weinberger says, Ed, um, Tony Clifton. So I said, who's Tony? I didn't know. I said, who's Tony Clifton? He said, well, it's a long story. It's so like Tony Clifton is actually Andy Kaufman, but we made a separate deal. He's got a separate agent. He's got... <laughs> And he won't admit that it's him. So I said, well, yeah, I'm game. I'll go along with that. So the, we, the night, it was, a Friday, it was a, the Friday night show. And then Monday, we're going to start rehearsal. Friday night, Andy comes up and he says, look, he comes up to me. He says, Danny, I'm going to do a college. He used to do, go around talk to colleges a lot. He'd go around do his, his act. He says, I'm going off to, like, who knows where. He named the town somewhere for, the, for next week, and I'm doing my college date. I want you to take care of Tony. I said, okay, I will. And I'm going along with it. I said, okay, I will. He said, you know, he's never acted before. And blah, 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 blah. I said, all right, well, I'll, you know, I'll take care of him. I didn't know what to expect. Monday morning, we get to the read-through. We used to read-through on a Monday. We shot the show on a Friday night. So we rehearse all week. Monday, the guy walks in. Now, we're, he's late, first of all. We usually read 11 o'clock. It's like 11.30. We're all sitting around the table. And a guy walks in with a blue tuxedo with the black in it, you know, right, with a ruffle shirt, cigarette, jewelry like, like Sammy Davis looks bare compared to this guy, <laughs> right? He's got, like, you know, he's got a toupee on. He's got, he's, he looks good. I mean, he looks like you don't see the jowls, but he's got, like, his face is different, you know, and he's like... And he comes in, he says, hi, hi, how are everybody? I'm sorry I'm late, but I had to rewrite the script. And he throws it on the table. Now, we listen to this for like two days where the guy can't, he can't walk and talk at the same time. You know, he said, my God, what are we going to do? We have to get rid of this guy. So we, so I said to Ed, I said, we got Friday night, the show's coming up. The guy, he's, you know, he's just, hey. he did lines like, how she walks when she lies, cries when she laughs, she cries when she sings. It's like, well, what are you going to do with the guy, right? Well, how are we going to work? So he says, all right, well, we got to fire him. So I said, well, fire him. We'll hire somebody else. He said, well, i got to call Andy first. <laughs> so what do you mean? He said, well, Andy, i got to talk to George, his manager. So he calls his manager, right? They go through this whole charade. Andy's like nine blocks away. They called him in wherever he was on the college date, right? And he said, look, I don't want you to fire Tony because he's a bad actor. So what are we going to do? Well, let him come real late tomorrow, and you publicly fire him in front of everybody. So I said, oh, they said, okay. So the next day, this is like sick, right? But he had it, so we're all going through this. <laughs> so the next day, like we were, it was like a Wednesday, we hired a, another actor that night, and I was working with him at night. But the next day, we had a like, so we're all there on the stage, the taxi stage, we're waiting for the guy. It's like 11, we usually start at 9, like 11, rehearsals. It's like 11.30, he walks in, right? He's got two hookers, like with like these really scanty outfits on with like bubble hair like out to here, and they're carrying packages, right? For us, presents, all little gifts. Like I got a little dog that went, yep, 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 yep. You know, a little dog. And he goes, I'm sorry I'm late, but I rewrote the whole script. So Ed fires him, right? He says, look, yeah, look, uh, Tony says, I'm sorry, you know. And they had it all arranged that he was going to do this and he was going to leave. I'm not going anywhere. I'm staying right here. <laughs> and he's fighting with Ed, right? The last thing I remember was the guy getting taken out by security guards. And he's going, yous will never work in Vegas again. <laughs> But he did it. He did. He was like, that was like Andy. Okay. I was curious, um, what advice do you have to young actors? Because if uh, you start out in the business and you're not the quote Robert Redford type, if there's probably a certain point in time in your career, seriously, there's probably a certain point in time in your career where you became the power, you got the power, and now you could start choosing your scripts and you could start deciding what you want to do. Yeah. What advice do you have for people who personally aren't at that particular point yet. Well, well, what I was, the thing about it is like what you do is in terms of choosing scripts, 
and stuff like that. I mean, that's like, like you say, that comes later on. I think like uh, you, should, you should try to do, uh, you just get out there and try to do as much as you can in terms of like, uh, you know, um, for instance, you know, all plays and, and whatnot. You know, and uh, uh, I don't know what, what I did was, I, like I said, I just like went up for as many things as I could. You know, I studied hard, and uh, you know, you'd, and uh, in terms of people, uh, like for instance, uh, once you get to the point where where people are, are are saying you choose whatever you like, well, that's another story. I don't know. I'm sorry, I can't answer that. Thanks. Uh, we have time for two more questions. I have two questions. Um, how tall are you? Five feet. And uh, do you have a favorite episode of Taxi? Um, I think my favorite episode would be uh, called Louie and the Nice Girl. It's, uh, it's the first one that Rhea did with me. It's where she plays a candy yeah. vendor. And I, uh, I fall in love with her. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> And the and the my second favorite is where I put my hand on Leonardo's ass. <laughs> I was. Uh, it's my turn. Yeah, I was uh, impressed by a couple of the surreal, you know, images that you conjured up for Throw Mama, particularly the one at the end of the car crash when you pan along the fence and then dissolve to the prison and. You know, mm -hmm. along the bars, but uh, I was impressed by the look of the whole film. You know, like you gave a lot of attention to, particularly for a first-time director, you gave a lot of attention to things like color and, you know, the texture and you know the design of you know the light and all that other complicated mm -hmm. stuff. I'm just wondering if you had any kind of art background, because you had a good visual well, sense. What what I did with uh, with with this particular story was I. I um, I chose, first of all, I wanted it, uh, the Medigliani kind of colors. And what I did was I, um, I brought in uh, a, a book of his work and passed it to you know, all the art department, told them this is what, like I wanted to keep it in, in those, those tones. And I don't, I, I don't have any art background per se. I didn't go to, to, to art school or anything like the that. The look of the film looked kind of like a children's storybook. First. Yeah. I'm wondering if that, that shot that I mentioned, was that written in the script or is that yours? The, 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 the shot, uh, the transition between the, that's my transition with the bars and the, yeah, the, uh, and the um, picket fence. And I like to, I like to kind of do things uh, as much as I can that way uh, in terms of, uh, you know, in terms of transitions in a film. Um, yesterday, Shelley Long told us. Who? Shelley Long told us what it was like for her to work a little with Bette Midler, and I was wondering what you thought of working with Bette. Uh, well, I love working with Bette. I think she's really terrific. I, I, we didn't have a lot to do in the movie together. I mean, she was very nice to me. Uh, we, were, we had a we had a couple words said one day. We waited for 21 days for the fog to lift. Uh, at Santa Monica so she could throw me off a pier. <laughs> we had a good time. She's very, very nice. She's very sweet. Bet. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Next question, anybody? <laughs> oh. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So rock, you know, you go to a concert, you know, and, uh, you know, Springsteen or Dylan or something like that. Go ahead, keep applauding. Keep applauding. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Somebody, somebody told me this morning they read something where, where they heard a news program that, that Bruce forgot the words to Born to Run. Is that true? Well, that's acceptable, right? Yeah. No? No? Huh? Take a hike. <laughs>